of the census, and we don't know exactly what the population is, somewhere between 10 and 13 million. Taking the more conservative estimate, that would mean 867,000 disabled children of school age in South Sudan. Uh, in 2012, only 1.3% of primary learners, that's 18,687, uh, were children with disabilities. So the vast bulk of children in South Sudan with disabilities are either in school and not identified as having special educational needs or just do not go to school and it will be both of those groups. Why do we need an inclusive education system then? Well. We know from research around the world and studies all around the world, and you want to see examples of that, you can look at my, uh, my book, uh, Implementing uh, the uh, Inclusive Education, a handbook for implementing the CRPD in Commonwealth countries. There are many hundreds of examples there. There are many others in the Y inclusion pamphlet and in the other documents that I've mentioned. But all of these amount to the following findings. The inclusive education of all children improves the quality of education for all. This is going against what most people would think and many parents will say, well if you put all these children with disabilities in my child's class, aren't they going to hold them back? And there are several reasons why that is not the case. The first is that the teacher has to prepare lessons more carefully, think about what they're teaching. The second is that the peers will support the learning and through supporting the learning of their disabled peers will learn better themselves. It addresses the numbers dropping out or never attending school. And this is probably the most important factor that will influence that large number we've just identified in South Sudan who are not in school. It's based on social justice and human rights. So it's not just a small group of the elite who are going to school, but every child from every family will get a chance to go to an inclusive school. And all members of the community will have a buy-in to that. It's also cheaper than creating a separate special school system. It strengthens community involvement and it combats negative attitudes. It has a multiplier effect on the local economy. Just think of all of the 3,500 primary schools being upgraded in South Sudan that will be building contracts and work for people in the local community. We will need school support workers to come and help teachers which will again create jobs. We will need in creating kitchens to have teams of people who will cook food in every school so every child has a decent meal every day. At the moment fewer than 10% of schools provide a daily meal. So inclusion will not just be about education, it will be about providing a local hub for children and children's rights and support within the community. Of course, the facilities, once we have them, can also be part of catch-up for all the parents who didn't get education because of the troubles over the last 40 years. And we can run literacy and numeracy and skills-based classes in our schools once they're adapted and everybody can come to them. All of this has the effect of increasing gross domestic product and will lead, we think, for every year children as a whole spend in school additional leads to a 1% increase on average in GDP. So these are goals that are certainly worth trying to strive for and achieve and will have benefit effects on the whole, uh, whole country. Okay, so let's look at the country. It's a large country, South Sudan. 600,000 square kilometres and has many different cultures, languages, at least 60 languages, many different cultures and many different environments from dry, almost desert-like conditions up in the north uh, west to equatorial rainforest in the southwest and mountain scrub in the southeast and then hot, humid uh, floodplains of the Nile uh, going through a lot of the area with big seasonal changes in weather. We would have liked to ask our survey questions across the whole 
10 states. But because at the time that we did this in March, there was still conflict, and there is still conflict, going on in Upper Nile, Jongli, uh, Warabo, and uh, Unity states, we were limited to questions in nine counties in six states. And these are Western Bahar El Ghazal, the lakes, uh, Western Equatoria, Eastern Equatoria, Central Equatoria, and Warabi. And uh, you can see those blue circles there which show where we ask the question. Now, as regards the methods that we used for this, we relied on the Light for the World office light, uh, to identify people in these areas to come to Juba for training, which was delivered by my colleague Alex Horschild and uh, the country coordinator, Toyin. And uh, the, what we tried to select there, within the nine counties, so we had one or two facilitators from each of the nine counties, their job was to go back and find six schools, five primary and one secondary, uh, a focus group of six parents, and a focus group of six county officials. Now within the schools, when they arrived in the school, they had a camera and a tape recorder to interview a head teacher interview. They had a questionnaire to go over with the head. They were to film the school environment, or if they couldn't do that, then fill in an audit form about what they saw in the classes they visited. They were then to have a focus group meeting after school with six teachers in the school and a focus group meeting with six students, three disabled and three non-disabled. They were to observe what was going on in the classroom and we tried to see if we could get children to map the number of children out of school in their localities. That was a little too ambitious and the results we got back, although interesting, could not be said to be representative in any way and we have therefore left them out of uh, the research. Now, the results that we got are quite interesting. Uh, we asked uh, all of the different focus groups what they thought the main barriers were in uh, their schools to children with disabilities coming to the school. And these varied quite a bit with negative attitudes and ignorance coming out as pretty high, lack of training and uh, lack of resources. But we also had things like the long distance to schools, particularly in uh, Moraba County and Torrit, which are more rural and isolated. In Juba, which is more urban, uh, accessibility to the school buildings, poverty, they've had a big influx of people, refugees from other parts of the country, and there's a lot of poverty, and ignorance came out there. Uh, in the other five, we had uh, different diagrams coming out, in Mundri East, accessibility and the long distance to schools was the primary factor. And uh, in Mundri West, teacher training came out as a bigger issue with accessibility to the school buildings. In Rumbek, uh, we found ignorance and accessibility were the two largest. While in Wa, in uh, Warabi, we found that poverty was the biggest factor stopping dis children with disabilities coming to school. And in Torrit, we found teacher training uh, was also a factor. So if we look at all of those together, combined for all the people we talk to, you find that the largest one is accessibility of the school buildings and the long distance that was needed to travel to schools, followed by negative attitudes, ignorance and discrimination. And then the third highest was lack of expertise in teacher training and fourth, poverty, uh, followed by lack of resources and materials. Teasing and bullying was quite small with only 40 respondents saying that. And uh, lack of communication, braille sign language, 25 respondents. Lack of awareness, 20 respondents. And lack of support, 15 respondents, uh, poor peer support the least. And in fact, good peer support was one of the strongest things that was already coming out from the schools. We look at the different ways that children with disabilities can be included in school. We find that these really depend on your thinking about disability. 
So if you think that a disabled child is of no value and is cursed or brings bad luck on your family, you're not going to send them to school. They're going to be excluded. That's number one. In some countries, Kenya for instance, they have developed a model of, based on uh, missionary schools for special needs of quite a large network of special schools throughout the country. These do not accommodate the 1.4 million disabled children. They accommodate about 20,000. But they use up a huge amount of resource. And in our seminars, when we looked at this in Nairobi with the technical committee, we all agreed that that was not the way forward for South Sudan. So then what are we left with? Well, number three could be a regular school with a unit attached, but with the children not really mixing. Number four could be trying to make all the children fit into the schools as they are. If you like, shaping the square peg into the round peg. Or we could have attached to the mainstream school, a resource-based room where the children spend some of their time with specialist support, learning braille, sign language, reinforcing what they've learned and the rest of their time in the mainstream class. Or number six, we can have all the different shapes and sizes of children in the same classroom where all are welcome and the school adapts to provide the support and make adjustments. Now we showed these six diagrams to all of our respondents in our survey. And it was interesting that what they came up with was overwhelmingly supporting the last, that all children should be educated together. That's the top lines there. The different coloured lines are for brown is the total, children is blue, uh, parents purple, teachers green, and head teachers. Um, uh, reddish brown and then the last one officials but you can see that overwhelmingly all groups who we interviewed in the nine counties across South Sudan put inclusion as their number one choice we didn't expect that and it is quite comforting to know that we are on the right track that intuitively people think that all children should go to school together the task now, of course, is to make this a reality. Some people did go for the resource school, and that was the second highest, uh, and then integration. Very few people going for small units or segregated education. And the only people who were mentioning those were primarily for blind and deaf children because people were aware of that model. OK, now this next one gets even more complicated. But... We thought we would try this another way. So we put together seven matched pairs of photographs. We call it photo elicitation. So in number A there, underneath the table, you can see there are uh, children working round the table together and there are children in rows, as we traditionally have in our classes, and we asked people to choose which was the better one for inclusion. And as you can see from the table above, the green column in A, A1, nearly everybody chose the children working round tables rather than uh, working in the rote learning uh, de desks facing the front. That was true for nearly all the photos that we had chosen which uh, characterised inclusion, apart perhaps from B, where we had two pictures, the top one, B1, blind children talk together, all of whom have braille machines, Perkins Brailers, and then in a mainstream class, a blind student with their peers using a uh, Perkins Braille machine. There was, uh, that was tied in Juba, and there were a significant number of uh, respondents in a number of other uh, places, such as in uh, Ye and uh, Wow, who also went for the wrong picture if you are talking inclusion. And we think the reason for that was probably that uh, it looks uh, a better resourced room rather than anything else. I can't go through all of these. They are in the additional report, but they give you an idea. I'll give you two more to show you the sorts of findings we're getting. 
C1 is a group of children, secondary children, learning Braille all together. That's not a, a deaf class. And the second class is a class of deaf children where only deaf children are uh, learning sign language. Sorry, I, did I say Braille? C1 is about all learning uh, sign language together. C2 is about only learning in a separate class or separate school. And then D1, again, there was some uh, overlap there. But then on D1, D2, children with learning difficulties, either being isolated and separate in a separate room, as in D1, or D2, being part of a class with all others. There was a very clear indication on all of these, if we go back to uh, the previous, this diagram here, that's B1 and B2, I'm showing you that. Uh, we can see in the green here, all of them uh, really going for the practice of inclusion as well as the theory of it. So this photo elucidation was very useful in showing that it's not only the idea in the abstract, but the concrete form that inclusion will take in an African context, which people were opting for as well. All right. Okay. If we look at our examples now, which we, we put a number of examples from neighbouring countries in to uh, show how inclusion can work, we picked on the island of Zanzibar, where initially in the late 90s there were 20 pilot schools, these then doubled and there are now 86 schools out of the 420 on the island, which are considered inclusive. 144 teachers have been trained in Braille and Sign Language, 2,225 teachers have been trained in inclusive education. They worked in this model from the bottom up using ZAPAD, which is an association for uh, Z Z Zanzibar Association for Persons with Developmental Disabilities, Learning Difficulties, not usually the place most people start, but the most excluded group. And they found willing support from networks of parents who wanted their children to have an education. They ran pilot schools where the parents and facilitators trained the teachers the parents knew more about their children's condition than the teachers, and so they did the initial training. They then set up local uh, training centres where more detailed training was given for all governors, and uh, the Department of Education also set up an inclusive education department. This was funded by NORAD through the Norwegian uh, disability uh, thing and has been a success. One of the problems starting only with disability is that they only worked on the second track. They didn't work on the first track of inclusion for all. And I think that was a weakness of that. The second example is Tanzania, which borders uh, South Sudan. They have for a number of years had a policy uh, informed by inclusive values. They've tried various things. It hasn't always worked. We've now got a much more specific model that's being used. All teachers are being trained uh, to respond to all learners. There's a resource-based model. But they found that just teaching teachers wasn't enough, that you needed to have a project where you had a modelling inclusive education. So ADD, a uh, NGO, is working with the ministry in 265 schools in the coastal area to model inclusive education and that is really beginning to bear fruit. What this tells us, you can't produce inclusive education all in one go. What we have to have is some uh, areas that start doing it before others and that's what we've put in our plan and that that then is reproduced uh, across a wider number of schools until at the end of the five years we are going to scale across all uh, countries. Our third example is from South Sudan itself. Uh, Life of the World with EU funding in 2011-2013 uh, did some work on inclusive education in Ye and Mundri, about 45 schools. Uh, they developed the knowledge, practice in selected schools, training, equipment and, and adapted buildings. Uh, they noticed that in those schools there was a 140% increase in the enrolment of children with disabilities. There was a 25% increase in retention and reduction in dropout. And 
the creation of awareness in uh, community and developing schools supported much more movement. Now this was only a pilot, but it did show that uh, much could be achieved. Most of the training in this done was done by community-based rehabilitation professionals and therefore was to some extent limited. What we actually need is training from teachers that go into the full range of pedagogy that is required to transform the school as well as the physical uh, adjustments and work on attitudes. Those are important but we must also have the pedagogy. So, what are we actually proposing for South Sudan which you are to respond to? Well, we need to develop inclusive education at four levels. The national state, each of the ten states, at the 87 counties and at the school level. We need legislative and a support framework, legislative change and a support framework. We need to integrate these new guidance and legislation with that which already exists. Now this is not easy because currently in South Sudan we are in an emergency situ education situation in many parts of the country. But INI, in their guidelines, have produced guidance on for developing inclusive education in emergency education situations. So even in the camps we can actually start developing inclusive education. The five-year program, which will start if peace allows and there is sufficient uh, peace accord, will run over five years from 2015 to 2020. And we will start with just a few uh, schools in each uh, state, one or two counties in each state in the first phase and then more. Those counties will be the first to develop uh, an inclusion resource centre the head teachers in those schools will be the first to go for training. The training will need to be developed with international consultants and with the Ministry of Education and Schools and Training. And uh, we will need to have that rolled out. And really the work on this needs to start this autumn if we're going to start the program next uh, spring. We will need to set whole school standards for supporting the learning of all and this will mean re-looking at the curriculum and the learning materials and the learning resources that we produce so that in greater and greater numbers differentiated resources can be provided for the pilot schools and then for all schools. We will also introduce person-centred learning and life plans for all children with disabilities, to identify their impairments and the necessary accommodations these may make. Now not every school may be able to make these identifications, so in each county there needs to be at the Inclusion Resource Centre both pedagogists, teachers, but also community-based rehabilitation and medical professionals who can make the right diagnosis. To give you an example if we get it wrong, in several East African countries those with poor sight, albinos and others who are short-sighted or just need glasses, have been sent to blind schools and have learned Braille. They never needed to learn Braille. By wrong diagnosis at the beginning, a huge amount of resource has been wasted, which should have gone to those children who needed it. So we need to get the identification of the impairment right at the beginning. But that shouldn't lead us into a functional approach the child, once that is there, in their person-centred life plan, should have the adjustments that are necessary so they can actually operate in the mainstream school. The support that they might need from a monthly visit from a professional itinerant teacher based at the county centre. The sorts of programmes that they'll need for their teachers and the resources that will be needed by the school all need to be in the plan. So all children in the plan that is being put forward by the technical committee will attend their local school. And instead, the additional resources that might need will be in county resource centres backed up by state specialist uh, centres where uh, those resource centre people from the county can come together from time to time to report back. We will also need... Uh, so the key to this will be county inclusion centres, 
We will work with schools and the local community and it's very important to involve parents and others in the local community. The success in Zanzibar was involving people at the local level. So we are suggesting there should also be local inclusion facilitators who can find out and contact families where children don't go to school currently and make sure that they do go to school. Make links with the county inclusion centres so that their person-centred plans are developed and that we build these strong links. We need to develop <coughs> assessment and materials for all so that these are available in the schools where children who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, have a learning difficulty, are working three or four years behind others in their class. This means moving away from single grade teaching to multi-grade teaching throughout the education system and will be a big challenge, but we cannot develop inclusion without it. <coughs> we will need to have access to sign language and braille. And I've mentioned that we need to hurry to develop the braille the Braille systems and the sign language dictionary for South Sudan. We need one system uh, which is based on uh, South Sudan and presumably English. Don't forget when we are doing inclusion for all, disability is only one wing of this. We will need to also be uh, looking at children who learn in their mother tongue and providing teaching up until grade three in their mother tongue uh, and that might be for children who are disabled at the same time or blind and in their mother tongue. So we'll need braille and sign language materials in their mother tongue as well. We'll need peripatetic specialist teachers from the county centre. We'll need sufficient supply of those. And the work that's being done on the curriculum for training all teachers on inclusion will be an important part of that. The head teachers all will need to have some induction and training on inclusion particularly those who are going to lead in the first few waves of schools, because they will then need to lead training for all of their staff, not just those who are new to teaching, but all staff, with a session every uh, an afternoon a week on problem solving within the school. And joint problem solving teams will need to be constructed, because between them, they will have the answers to most of the problems that are posed by the barriers uh, that are currently there for children with disabilities and other needs, but they will also need to be supported by the national state and the state and the county in having the resources that they need to do this. They'll need to be accessible schools and we'll need to do this by perhaps demobilising teams from the army and training them in building skills so they can actually convert the schools very quickly not only to providing access, but providing electricity, secure uh, spaces, roofs that don't leak uh, and are sunproof, and solar panels so that schools can begin to get into the 21st century with ICT. All of these things are possible with the switch in the budget we've talked about and using the manpower that is currently sucked up in the army, uh, which we'll be needing to dispose of into other useful occupations. Some of them will also be able to retrain as teachers. Um, so we'll need to improve school access and building. And of course to put in kitchens so that we can have a decent meal uh, and sanitation. Less than 10% of schools have decent sanitation and those toilets will need to be part of a national template of making it school accessible so that we can use local resources, the community and others to build accessible toilets, segregated for boys and girls, because many girls tell us that is one of the reasons they won't go to school, uh, with running water, if necessary, from uh, drainage, from drain pipes, but also boreholes at each school, so that the aquifers that are plentiful beneath our uh, schools can actually supply clean running water, which will stop disease and make our children healthier. So all of these things go together. We will need this ongoing teacher training, but we will need to involve the community in raising awareness about what we're trying to achieve so there is a buy-in from the majority of people in the country that they see the benefits for all children and all young adults as we move towards the vision of South Sudan 2040, 
where uh, a country fit for all its inhabitants is there. And to make sure this is happening, all inspectors will need to have training on how to monitor that good inclusive practice is working. So if you think that that is important and the things that we've been talking about are important, then get a hold of this document, discuss it with your colleagues and answer the questions in the next few weeks so that we can make this a finalised document and we can get in the, uh, September to December of 2014 planning the rollout for the five-year programme of inclusive education. This isn't going to be funded by South Sudan itself. There are many and have been many willing donors across the world to support the youngest democracy in the world. But you also have all of you a duty to get your house in order because many of those donors are now questioning whether they want to keep investing in South Sudan. So a big push on this plan to get inclusion for all and including disabled children, disabled young people into this will make a huge difference in the new Sudan that we uh, new South Sudan that we want to see. Thank you very much.